All right, so um, in order to not delay the process too long, um, I thought it would be a good time to get things underway. So I thank you everybody and welcome to our breakout session on the strengthening of science systems. I am happy to be joined here by our thematic leads of the strengthening science systems discussion. So we have uh, Elena Rovinskaya, Program Director for the Advanced Systems Analysis Program at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, who will kick us off. We have David Kaplan, who is our Senior Research Specialist from the International Science Council. And joining us also in the background, who will pro possibly pop in for some discussion, is uh, Sergei Sizov our science diplomacy officer here at EASA as well. So there will be lots of experts to join in the discussion with you. Um, after the presentation, we'll be welcoming discussions with the audience. So if you have a question, you can either go into the chat, which you'll find at your right, or you can also access um, the video and audio button, which you will see at the top of the uh, discussion screen. And I'll invite you in, and then you can ask your questions live to our panelists. Um, I have seen yesterday, if any of you were participating in the session, sometimes there are some technical issues. So in that context, please just populate it into the chat box, and I'll be happy to read it out for you. Um, and also, of course, as you listen to the presentation and the discussions, we would welcome any thoughts and ideas that you may have to help us uh, build on the dissemination of the recommendations to policymakers and leaders in your sphere of influence. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with us with any additional questions. I've posted links to all of the different reports in the chat box for your viewing pleasure. And with this, I'm going to hand off to the introduction, uh, the introduction to Elena just after I share my screen. So Elena, I'll let you get started while I'm sharing the presentation for everybody. David is first. Uh, I so I'm going to. I'm oh, going so I'm to... so sorry. I don't know why. <laughs> no problem. I had it no backwards. Problem. My bad. Well, let me begin by thanking you all for being here today, wherever you may be situated. Our time is obviously very limited, so please allow me to get straight into the presentation. Our objective in this very limited time that we have available is th are three things. First, to give you an outline of how we've approached the issue of strengthening science systems the processes that led up to the report, and finally, of course, an outline of the report itself. We hope at the end of our presentation that you'll be motivated to read the report. So the first step in the process, if we can have the slide, please. Thank you. So the first step, in, it's, it's up, thank you. So the first step in the process was the production of a background paper. So what the paper did was to examine how science systems had responded to the pandemic and also how the pandemic in turn was impacting upon science systems. And it's these issues that formed the first part of our thematic report, how science systems both impacted upon their pandemic and how the pandemic in turn has affected science systems. And that's what you'll find in the first part of this report. Now this background paper was distributed in advance of the first of our consultations. And with this assessment in mind, we asked 14 prominent scientists, 14 prominent scientists to reflect on, and this was the question, how, given the experience of science systems in the pandemic, science systems might be transformed so as to be better equipped to face any future crises. So we gather these thoughts and ideas from the scientists and we put these before participants for their reactions, inviting comments and also suggestions in two further workshops. Participants in these workshops were drawn from a diverse body of stakeholders, from funders, science publishers and journalists, policy makers, private sector. Our assessment, our overall assessment was while the science system responded quite well to the pandemic in general, there was indeed significant room for improvement. And we identify that improvement needs to happen in what we term three axes, three axes of improvement. Next slide, please. Do we have the next slide? David, it seems that Nicole dropped from this call. Maybe we could just continue without slides for a while. Okay. I think she's trying to reconnect now. Okay, so my apologies. So, so there are three axes of improvement. Science systems need to react more rapidly, be more agile. 
Science systems need to enhance the quality of their output to be more reliable. And they need also to more effectively address the needs of policymakers and the citizenry to be more relevant. So that's on three dimensions, more agility, higher quality, and more, more reliable, more effective. And of course, there are trade-offs. For example, more agility could be achieved by lowering the quality, but that is not our objective. It's not our, object, our objective to trade off one axis for another. What we are aiming for in this report is to simultaneously improve the capacity of the science system to respond to any future crises along all three axes. For the science system to move to a new frontier, whereby the science system would be more simult simultaneously more agile, higher quality, and of greater relevance. Now, of course, to move the science system to a new frontier on all these three axes will require changes in many, many different areas, many new policies and interventions. And our report has a total of 38 recommendations. We've collected and organized these recommendations in five interrelated, what we call buckets, what we also have termed in the report transform transformative changes. I read these changes. I unfortunately don't have the, the PowerPoint in front of you, but these are the transformative changes. Firstly, we need to strengthen transdisciplinary research and networking on critical risks and system resilience. Strengthen transdisciplinary research and networking. We need to enhance knowledge diffusion within science systems. Knowledge diffusion within science systems has to be enhanced, improve the quality and efficacy of science policy interface at national, regional, and global levels is the third. The fourth, fourth transformative change, enhance communication of scientific knowledge, public understanding, and trust in science. And the final one, the final transformative change, to increase capacity of science systems to respond rapidly to crises with high quality research. So that's our overall tra five transformative changes. To elaborate on those, I hand over to my fellow, uh, to my colleague, uh, uh, Eleanor Rovenskaya. Thank you, David, and greetings also from my side, as well as apologies for this, uh, for this technical problem that we are having. No matter how many times we tested this, it's still, still there is always the probability of a failure of that sort. Anyhow, so if you could see the nice diagram that we had on the slide, it would be easier to, to discuss that, but, but maybe that creates also the motivation for the, for, for, for you to, to look at our report and, and look it up there in the report. But let me go through the, these recommendations, these five buckets of recommendations that David just spoke about and zoom into each one of them uh, very, very briefly. So recommendations aimed at strengthening transdisciplinary research and networking on critical risks and systems resilience, which is the first uh, bucket, emphasize the importance of developing and maintaining national and international capacity for risk and resilience research. This was also discussed in the plenary session very much. Uh, where the capacity is weak, international collaboration can actually be very helpful in providing knowledge necessary to manage a crisis. For example, in case of COVID-19, some developing countries uh, were able to utilize knowledge that they gained through international collaboration, uh, and thus they were able to manage COVID-19 actually rather well, even if their own capacity was, was limited. Overall, COVID-19 highlighted the importance of international scientific collaboration, uh, again, as a major tool to make national and international response both agile and effective. In order to increase the capacity of the science system to respond rapidly to crisis with high quality research, which constitutes the next bucket of recommendations, it is essential to develop and sustain institutions undertaking research on risk. Capacity should be also uh, stored in institutions. Unfortunately, in a number of countries, the funding of institutions focused on epidemiology and public health risks and response to disasters was significantly reduced just prior to the COVID-19 crisis. 
Uh, the potential should further be explored for a system of so-called emergency expert teams that can be activated on demand uh, in response to crisis. So now when we can see the slides, uh, this, this slide, you can hopefully follow, uh, you can follow my, uh, my explanations. Um, a system of easy to access grants could be established to fund research into unanticipated and urgent challenges. Evaluation systems need to be adjusted so as to recognize the contribution made by scientists to addressing crises. Special attention should be given to incentivizing young researchers. Uh, the development of easily reusable research models and data should be prioritized and the use of general purpose models should be expanded. Critical to agility and research quality is to be able to use data and knowledge that is possessed by the private sector. Therefore, ways of enhancing cooperation between public and private sector science should be explored. Now we move to the third bucket of recommendations uh, referred to as knowledge diffusion within the science system, which is a basic enabler of the agility, reliability and relevance of science that is being produced in response to a crisis. A number of improvements to the publication review system in this context should be implemented. Also, to facilitate access to existing research and navigation through the existing research, researchers should be incentivized to make data models and computer codes open and easily accessible. Depositories for data and existing research, as well as platforms aggregating research on a particular topic, should be developed and used. So these three buckets uh, of recommendations we just, uh, we just looked at, uh, they dealt with the science system itself. And the next two buckets uh, are concerned with how science interfaces with the public and policy. Uh, science denial and misinformation have been increasingly, uh, increasing rapidly during the pandemic, as we all know. A bucket of recommendations here focuses on the enhancement of communication of scientific knowledge, public understanding and trust in science. One key recommendation here is that the scientific literacy of citizens should be enhanced. This can be supported by the provision of easily accessible sources of scientific results and information for the general public. Scientists should be trained and incentivized in the communication of scientific knowledge and need to be more actively engaged in, in countering science denial and misinformation. The capacity and integrity of science journalism and science media should be further enhanced. The last bucket of recommendations on our list uh, focuses on the improvement of quality and efficacy of the science policy interface. The interface between science and policy is provided through institutions. There is no one-size-fits-all institutional arrangement for all countries, of course, but whatever institutional arrangement is chosen, the constituting institutions need to be robust and have stable funding. To further strengthen national and international science policy institutions, networking among them should be further promoted. On the other hand, policymakers should also have a chance to interact with a wider academic community uh, beyond the designated institutions as appropriate. Clearly, COVID-19 was a multidimensional crisis and future crises will be at least as multidimensional. Thus, science advice should engage a wide number of uh, dis uh, scientific disciplines and a systemic uh, approach to policy advice should be promoted. When governments consider a range of science advice offered, the reasoning behind the policy choices should be made transparent. As you can see, there is, there is really a lot there in this, in this report. We could only highlight uh, some things and I stop here and in the remaining time, we will be happy to hear your comments and answer questions. Thank you very much. I hand over back to Nicole. Hello, everybody. So thank you very much, Ellen and David, for your fantastic presentation and for taking us through this report. There is a lot of work there and it's quite obvious that there are many, many great minds who were brought together um, as part of this discussion. So the floor is now open to any of our participants to ask questions. There's so much material there that I am sure there, is, there must be many burning questions on everybody's minds. Um, once again, you can do so in two ways. So either you put your question into the chat box, which you'll find on the right, or if you push the button that uh, says share video and audio, I will bring you in so that you can um, ask the question directly. So I'm just going to also stop sharing my screen so that you have more visibility of Elena and David. 
Uh, and so while we wait for the other questions that I'm sure are going to come, I have uh, a first question to start you off with. And so, of course, there's th these five recommendations are fantastic. Um, but if my, the, the place near and dear to my heart is around science communication and the enhanced communication of scientific knowledge, public understanding, and trust in science. And so um, I guess my question around this is, is really what we're seeing in the mainstream media these days, there's a lot of discussions about misinformation. There's a lot of discussions about how people need to have a better understanding of science. And I was wondering if you would be able to share with us some of that conversation as, as this uh, recommendation developed, what were some of the observations that you were seeing and, and some of the discussions that brought this, observ this particular recommendation to the fore? Is there, is there particular areas that you think we should be thinking about a little bit more um, in terms of how we communicate? information, but also how we counter misinformation. Um, Elena, you're nodding your head, so I'm thinking I might direct it to you in the first instance. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, indeed, a lot of conversations around this topic, as you rightly suspected. Uh, maybe just to highlight one or two. So one discussion that we had quite extensively was what is the role of so-called science translators? and whether these are scientists themselves who should communicate more and maybe find ways how to communicate better or, 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 or better in, in, in certain sense, of course, or should that be a kind of separate profession of, of people who communicate and who know how to communicate. And obviously, there are pros and cons of, of each of these two models, but uh, yeah, there was a, a lot of discussion around that. And maybe the, the, the second one that I want to highlight is, which I briefly mentioned somewhere in that long list of things that I was, I was uh, talking about. This is about the incentive system. This is about uh, if we want scientists or somebody else to communicate uh, more um, and, and maybe differently. So we have to have a system that, that incentivizes that. And right now we know that, that this is something maybe of secondary importance if you, if you think of the scientific careers, especially of young researchers. So, so this kind of discussion of modifying the incentive system in that context specifically, yeah, we, we had them quite quite a lot of these discussions, and of course, the the, the devil is in details as always, and and yeah, this as always requires further discussions and and uh, further debate. Excellent, uh, David. Did you have anything to add? Is there anything that particularly stood out for you? Um, yes, let me add. Let me add to what Elena said. Um, in a, in a sense, I think we're talking to scientists, and we. In, in, in an important way, we, we're asking scientists to be both more humble and more aggressive. So more humble in the sense that scientists should be careful about making extravagant claims about their research, particularly at early stages of a crisis, as in the pandemic, where there are so many unknowns. And what we've seen often is scientists saying, I have the answer to X or Y, and being quite aggressive about this is the answer. We know that science rarely provides a definitive answer. And certainly at times of crises when there's so much unknown, scientists have to be straightforward. They have to advance what they think, but they also have to be clear about the limitations of their knowledge, the things that they don't know. So that the public then gets a clear idea that actually this is science moving in a progressive way towards a solution rather than providing a final definitive solution. Because a lot of distrust, I think, happens when people say, well, you, scientists keep changing their mind or they just disagree with each other. We have to educate people to understand that science is a progressive uh, movement forward and scientists must play their role, not by presenting their work as the final answer to everything, but as part of a process, particularly in crises where so much is unknown. I think on the aggressive side, we are asking scientists to play a more active role themselves in countering misinformation. Now, countering misinformation, of course, is a very big topic, which goes way beyond scientists into all sorts of other areas, but certainly involves scientists as well. And so as Ellen has outlined, we're looking for scientists to understand more and to appreciate more the importance of communicating their message to the general public and to policymakers and making that communication of science important to scientists, part of their, part of their scientific education. So scientists no longer think of themselves as purely producing scientific evidence and the truth, but also as part and parcel of that, communicating scientific evidence, scientific uh, findings, et cetera. Thanks. 
Uh, all right, thank you very much for that, David. So we have uh, in the chat box a couple of questions that have come in. So the first one is from Sarah Moore, and it asks, how do you relate your recommendations on how to change the science system in the context of short-term crisis with the need for science to respond more effectively to slow, ongoing crisis, climate change, poverty, conflict, uh, et cetera? Um, so uh, uh, I, I was wondering, uh, David, did you want to take this one first? Um, I can I can try. I need to, to put my thoughts together. I mean, it's it's clear right there's there's a short term well not so short term crisis with the with the pandemic uh this may this may be with us as we now come to recognize for many many years and and and, and in a sense i think there is a no 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 uh, uh clear difference between what's short term and what's long term and in fact many of the crises that we deal with that we think we will get beyond are often much, much longer lasting than we expected. And I think that will be the case with the, with the pandemic, unfortunately. So, so yes, there are short-term fixes and short-term fixes I think are very important, but it's the longer term that we have to keep our eye on. And I think the longer term requires us to think about what are the structural conditions that produce crises? What are the what are the uh, uh, environmental degradations, the inequalities, etc.? All those things I can don't want to go into too much detail, too much elaboration. But all the big things that we talk about, they have to be there as we address short term. So yes, there's short term issues that have to be addressed, but the longer term goals have to be in mind as you provide short term solutions. I don't know if that answers the question, but I think I think for me there's no strong differentiation. The short term should embody a view of what longer term you're looking for. Otherwise, you condemn to repeat the same crises or, or, or other crises in in the future. Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, Eleanor, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I can. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a very good question, actually. And and following. Following what David said before to the to the previous question, I think that's a point where we should be humble, indeed, as as ourselves researchers. Um, I think when we designed this report and and these recommendations, we mainly had crisis of the sort. We even we even uh, provided this as a guidance to our participants of the workshops that we assumed that no matter what we do in the long term, how much we invest in our system, there is always a probability that crisis like this can, can happen again, right? And then actually several recommendations that we put there are specifically focusing on such situations which are unexpected and which, uh, yeah, to which one has to react really quickly. And one of them, for instance, was the suggestion of emergency expert teams that can be activated on demand or easy to access grants or, or things like that. So, so there, there are, while of course we want to increase the long-term sustainability and all that, and many recommendations speak to that goal, uh, some other ones really are necessary for, for, for crises that really start completely unexpectedly, such as COVID-19. And as I said, a few of them are in this report already. Oh, thank you very much. So uh, uh, one of our, our participants, whose name is Tanya, has asked if it would be possible, if you have come across them, to talk through a few examples of where um, recommend uh, what you recommend may already exist or is already working. So is there places where there are pockets of where the pockets of desirable future are already present? Did any of these, did, did you come across any of this by any chance? Um, I'm going back and forth between the two of you. So Ellen, I don't know if you want to take this one first. Yeah, in fact, many of them are of this, of this sort because of course COVID let's say revealed or, or, or reminded rather reminded ourselves and and maybe emphasized certain trends that already existed before that right and so of course it's not that suddenly uh, we start to think how to improve the science system and as david was also highlighting and others uh, there are many other crises that that are happening at the same time so so maybe very little of what we are saying is exactly new so but but covid really allowed us to to focus on this or, or, or yeah basically made us focus on this i think 
Uh, and thus, yeah, indeed, many things are already being tried. I mean, the most obvious example here is open science. So we talk about, in our reports, we talk about uh, knowledge diffusion within the science system and emphasizes open, uh, the movement to open science. Obviously, it's happening already, but it's, it's happening only to a certain degree, right? So, so uh, again, COVID-19 reminds us once again how important it is to, to move to that, uh, to that system, for instance, if you talk about open science, or many other things, the, re the, the review system, for example, peer review system and journals and things like that. So many innovations are happening, for instance, again, in that area of review or open reviews are being practiced, uh, right, when, when the review is no longer anonymous kind of uh, work that also is not recognized, but uh, it's now becoming more and more recognized and things like that. Uh, but it's not to say that that uh, yeah, nothing should be done. So it's much more to be done uh, in that direction still. Thank you very much, uh, David. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that one? No, I think Ellen has put it very adequately. I mean, I'd only add other examples. I mean, we could add in there data, for example. Data is so critical, and we we make a number of recommendations in the report about the importance of of data and, and accessibility of data, and not just of the data, but actually of the mechanisms to interpret the data. And this, of course, has been also an issue that's been around for a while, but has been exemplified, I think, in the COVID context, where, where, where data has become absolutely, absolutely critical in resolving, resolving the crisis. So making data publicly available and accessible and usable is, is a really important part, not just of meeting future crises, but of the total efficiency of the science system. Excellent. So we're nearing the end of the um, the session here today. Um, there's well, there's one more question that's waiting in the chat box. I'm wondering, David and Elena, if you have a couple of extra minutes that we can uh, bring this one forward. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have. Uh, yep. Uh, that thank you very much so we have um I, and i apologize for any mispronunciations that may happen uh it looks like shirley Achter, who asks um how can uh, i make my research regional or international so such as interest in indigenous technologies for example how do you take this from a, a community or country to a regional or an, an international space do you have any suggestions or or has any um discussions around how you disseminate this kind of information moved forward And I think I started with Elena last time. So David, I'm going to ask you if you have any, uh, uh, if you're willing to start on this one first. So I think that's a difficult question. If I understood the question, the question is asking about indigenous knowledge and about its dissemination more widely. How do you disseminate more widely indigenous knowledge if I've got the question right? I, I, um, so this is a, is, is that correct? I, th I would. That's how I would interpret it as well. But please do feel free to correct me in the chat box if I have missed if we have misinterpreted. Go ahead, please. David. So, so, so the issue of indigenous knowledge. I'm I'm from South Africa, and indigenous knowledge is a very important part of our science system, and its indigenous knowledges are very critical, particularly particularly when we're looking for issues of how we promote. Uh, um, social social uh, um, uh, res resilience so resilience and local knowledge go together very closely how do what knowledge do people have about the environment about what's in their environment about how to use their environment to to promote resilience in the face of a crisis or in general life and these are important issues and they are uh, critical to 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 many countries of course, indigenous knowledge is, in a sense, indigenous. In other words, it is, it is fairly context specific in important ways. But there are elements that have that, that transition to other regions or other environments. And how to disseminate that is a, is a, is a major problem because I think what we find, but we're going beyond what's in our report, is that many indigenous knowledges tend to be national or regional or local and that is the problem for for ICA, for indigenous knowledge is its wider dissemination because it is so context specific um, so so in in resilience it's important 
but how and and it's important that we learn from the knowledge indigenous knowledge of others but how to how to diffuse the same indigenous knowledge from one environment to another is a big challenge it's something we could talk about but it's not dealt with in our, our report thanks thank you very much for that uh, Elena, did you have anything you wanted to add yeah i think that was an excellent answer david maybe to just add a little comment here and not to sound always very negative we also should maybe recognize some positive aspects uh, that uh, COVID-19 brought about, which we also observed even in our in the in this in this platform and in, in the process of working on this report. That uh, to say the obvious, I mean this this uh, Zoom era that we all are in now uh, really allows new connections, new networks, new ways of interacting with people. Maybe it's not perfect. But uh, as I said, even in our in our platform, we saw that and we spoke with people which we would probably not have been able to speak is uh, the, um, to speak if we just would convene, you know, the normal uh, physical meeting. So maybe uh, again, not want to sound like technology can solve all problems, but but it can certainly help us with that. And yeah, let's not forget that maybe. All right. Well, thank you for taking the extra time to, to answer the, the last question we had in the chat. I'm just going to highlight quickly that we also have some comments uh, thanking David for emphasizing the value of science communication. Um, and also that there's a there's also a book uh, a recommendation uh, in, uh, in the, the link in the chat box, as well as, as I mentioned before, we have all of the reports that you can easily access. Uh, by link at the top of the chat. So I'd like to thank uh, both of our presenters for their wonderful presentations and for taking us through the uh, Strengthening Science Systems thematic report, despite my small technical difficulties, which I apologize for. And um, you can join the networking session. So if you haven't done it before, the networking sessions are very entertaining. You push the, net push the networking button and it randomly pairs you with uh, people who are a part of the session. And so you get to meet some fantastic individuals. I was playing with it yesterday to test it. And I have to say, it was pretty entertaining. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you have any additional questions, you can reach uh, this thematic team or any of the other thematic teams uh, through the contacts link at the page, uh, the, the, the page that uh, I have uh, identified up at the top. So there's a link. Uh, for the, the, the and right in the stories.council.science under IASA-ISC, there's a contact us link and we will make sure to reach out to those of you who get in touch. Thank you again and we look forward to our next opportunity to talk. <laughs>